All right. Hello, I'm Matt Frawley. This is Maddie Talks. And there is this mythical figure on campus. <laughs> His name is Nick Vogue. But I can tell you, he is a real person, and he's here with me today. Nick, thanks so much for coming in today. It's great to be here. All right. Well, Nick is the Associate Director of the McGraw Center for Teaching and Learning here at Princeton University. Nick, we have the brightest students in the world. Why do we need a Center for Teaching and Learning? It's a good question, actually. People ask me that all the time when I'm outside of the orange bubble. Um, well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, the first one really is that it's not just that college is harder, but it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what, where, where we went to high school, there's no such thing as a liberal arts uh, high school, really. There's no such thing as a research, research high school. And that fact, those contexts and the faculty and how they're socialized into those communities as, you know, as a researcher shapes what they do in the classroom, how they teach, or what they're trying to accomplish, their goals for students, um, the way they test, the way they select materials, the curriculum, everything is really can be quite different. And so that poses new challenges for students. And we expect that, that uh, that's in fact what we say a liberal arts education is. It's learning how to be an expert learner. So we really think that's important. So just to give you an example, I have a student who came from a really highly regarded prep school. Uh, the way he was taught math, and he has a fa fantastic foundation, was never had a textbook, problem-based, seminar discussion. Well, he got here, and that, that's not the mode that's used in that particular uh, discipline. And so he really had to adjust to the packaging of instruction, of the content. So we have the McGraw Center. It, it serves a vital need here on campus. And then there's you working at the McGraw Center. How did that come about? Where, can you tell us uh, what, what your, kind of your, your um, academic pursuits and yeah. how it all led to being the associate director here? Well, yeah. So first, a little backdrop. The Center for Teaching and Learning at Princeton is kind of unique in that it has the faculty development mm -hmm. piece as well as training graduate students, both as current teachers and as future faculty, and then the learning support for undergrads. And that's actually quite unusual in higher ed. Um, so my previous stop before coming here was at UC Berkeley, where I did my graduate work. Um, and I worked at a, at a learning center there. So that was focusing on providing learning support for students. But I got involved as a graduate student myself, training and developing other graduate students as teachers because I was studying in the Graduate School of Education at Berkeley in the department or division, I should say, of language, literacy, society, and culture. And that's a mouthful, <laughs> but I'll explain what that means in a little bit. And, right. um, so I got really interested in that and working with my peers in thinking about instruction and their development. And then my, one of my advisors in graduate school was a very accomplished teacher as well as a fantastic scholar, and he had this position as a university, the chair in university uh, education. And so I was working with him on getting the message out to faculty and doing faculty development. And when all three of these constituencies, these three parties of the learning environment, the graduate student TA, who was a, like a preceptor, mm -hmm. the faculty member, and the students all got in the same room, the conversations about the process, these methods of learning from instruction were so rich and so illuminating. I just, that was really exciting and uh, thrilling. So when this opportunity at Princeton came up, it was a real, it's, it's, as I said, very unique. And so that opportunity to work with all three of these consistencies at once and at different times was really exciting. Um, but the way I got into this work really goes back to um, after graduation, I immediately went to Japan and I taught English. And that's really where I got, I got experience as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I was working with college students and adults uh, on, mainly on conversational English. When I returned to the United States, I decided I wanted to go, um, I became, uh, actually I got a position, I jumped over here. I, jumped, I wanted a uh, position, I got a position teaching reading for a private school, which is now national. In fact, it's, you'll see it around here, the Institute of Reading Development. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was only in California. And so we taught reading to all different ages, from five-year-old pre-kindergartners to adults, in engineers, lawyers, doctors. And it was a great foundation, and I learned a lot about reading. It, it, was it, uh, I'm sure, with the, obviously, with the five-year-olds, you're, you're teaching reading acquisition. Um, Reading acquisitions at all ages, but was it also, I think, it's speed reading or? Yeah, so we did different. Sub vocalizing, I guess, was, is it called, or yeah. that's one technique? Right, so we were addressing different needs or areas mm. at different levels. So even in like the second and third graders, it was really about developing a love of reading mm. and that the skills were 
utilized to facilitate that, make reading the decoding part easy mm -hmm. so kids can enjoy it. So it'd be about immersion. How can they identify with characters? Can they really feel and visualize these stories? And we saw that that is the engine both for uh, developing a love of reading and developing the skills. So we were actually trying to promote that and working with parents on how to do that for those little kids. And then as they, uh, for older kids that had a more academic purposes of reading, we gave them, we helped them with more academic types of skills. Mm -hmm. And then up through college uh, and adults it was how to read faster, more efficient, more efficiently. Um, and you mentioned this thing called subvocalization, which is the internal voice with, that we, most of us uh, read with. So we say the words as we view them and that's actually not necessary for mm -hmm. our comprehension. In fact, we understand first and then we say. Um, and, but it's ingrained in most of us because we were taught to read aloud. Right. So that's one of the things. A lot of the things to me were, were particularly interesting, which I still carry t into my work today, is coming to understand uh, the common patterns of, rhetor of writing. Mm -hmm. As it, so to, be, to read in a writerly way, to understand the conventions of making arguments and use what's called the structure strategy, um, to use that to guide our reading, to construct more uh, in-depth analytical representations in our minds of the text. So it's easy to teach people to move their eyes to read fast. The problem is thinking and comprehending twice as fast. Right. Yeah, that's the challenge. So, so you're here, and, and we're filming, uh, I think it was one more week of school, uh, then we go into reading period, and then obviously the finals. Um, what piece of advice, if you could just, or what piece of advice, or let's, better yet, like if you could wave your magic wand and help the most number of students with one thing, what would it be right now? At this Which, juncture in the... I know it's late in the game, Yeah, but there's... there's well, there's certain things that at this moment in the game is, is actually best to do, which is right. to step back from the particulars of the class mm -hmm. and try to understand that the course as a whole and see how the parts fit together mm -hmm. into a coherent design. So it's not always apparent to the student that the, all the parts fit together and there's a coherence to the, the class. It's almost like an essay sometimes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come together till the end or a book. Um, and so this is actually a great time to do that and to think to grasp that whole and then see how the parts fit. Right. And that helps us not only to understand at another level, but to helps us remember more. So mm -hmm. we remember when we see connections and relationships and organization. There's a saying in cognitive psychology, if, you know, if I have organization, I don't need to do repetition. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the strategy. And there's different ways to do that from mapping out uh, a class with a kind of mind map. Uh, so it might be bubbles. Uh, it might be creating some sort of your own study guide. Mm -hmm where you're very consciously seeking to make connections of the parts. Uh, the lectures, going back over your lecture notes is a really good one because that's the backbone of almost every class. Mm -hmm. That's the through line that the professor crafts. And then the readings a lot of times are brought in to support or supplement that, but they weren't written for the class. So if I understand the through line of the lectures, then I can grasp the whole. Right. What, um, I, I think uh, we, we've talked about how uh, that ability to abstract and let's say look at a, like a more comprehensive, holistic level to, of the class is a, one of the skills I think um, that the students need to learn when they come to college. Absolutely. They maybe probably didn't have to develop in high school. Was it right? Is there uh, like let's say there are two or three other ones that that are that you see the most that, that what students yeah. don't maybe are um, um, it's a bit um, underdeveloped in yeah. high school that needs to work here at college. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and that's a good question. So I think one is most high schools value uh, test on reproduction. Mm -hmm. Information is delivered to the student, and if they can reproduce that on a test quickly and accurately, then they'll do well. If they get 90% of that or more, they get an A. Right. Um, whereas at Princeton and many other colleges, really it's the application. And so on the one hand, it's learning to apply knowledge. That is a kind of subset of skills, but also how do I prepare myself for that? What study strategies, what learning strategies can I employ to address this other aspect, which is applying my knowledge to solve a new problem, to synthesize in the form of an essay to make an argument, things I haven't actually ever been asked to do before. And that's gonna be so frightening, because in high school, you pretty much know what's gonna be on the test. Yeah. And if, if there's a problem you've never seen before in your freshman, that first, uh, you know, in October, that's, that's gonna be frightening. I think it is, and it yeah. can, it's to shut people down on the test itself. Right. 
sometimes because they have this implicit, they don't even realize it. They're in, they think that they should know the answers to problems when they see them. Mm. And if they don't, then they get anxious, right. thinking, I, I didn't prepare well, I'm right. not going to do this, rather than uninter interpreting it the way I think most faculty would want, at least for some problems, which is, I need to figure out what the problem is asking me and mm. then figure out the solution. Mm. And so it's not a necessarily a uh, failing in your preparation if you can't recognize the problem how to solve it initially. Mm -hmm. But that feeling that it is can actually get in the way. Right, interesting. A second strategy, just what you said, right. is, actually, is anticipate, is being able to prioritize information and understand what's important, what are the goals and objectives mm -hmm. of a class. The exams I, will be the place that becomes most clear and concrete to students. Most high school instructors are making that pretty apparent. Right. And that's just by convention, that's not nearly this so much the case. So there's this idea that students have to figure out what's important. Uh, versus, I, I'm jumping in, I just yeah. fascinated because uh, versus um, because the high school teacher kind of tells them there's a 100% retention needed for mm -hmm. what the high school uh, teacher tells you where here, you just can't do that. I mean, you can't, Absolutely you can't right. remember 100% what what's in the book and what the lecture notes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to trust yourself, is that yeah. to, to, to differentiate the wheat and chaff, as you would say? Yeah, Not wheat and chaff, but you know, just what's mm -hmm. going to be important. Yeah, what's most important. And, yeah. and, th and most important from an expert's point of view as right. well, right. or for a particular class. Um, just one particular point that I would make, you know, the textbooks are not written for a Princeton audience mm. because there's not a big enough one, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so what professor, Princeton professors want students to learn from a math class or a science is, you know, if, right, we're a really elite institution. So, you know, there aren't necessarily elite textbooks. So that may not even be in the textbook. Um, so figuring out what is, is important, but I think it also can relieve students. We don't have to master every piece of information uh, and that which puts a lot of strain on our memory and memorization, which often is not fun. Uh, it's more thematic, conceptual. And so that can, while it's risky, if you will, to not try to master everything, mm -hmm. and that, that's true, I think, it's also liberating to know that if I truly and deeply understand something, right. I don't have to resort to trying to memorize everything. Right. You don't have to memorize that fifth example in that chapter or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. you, you've got it and you can figure it out, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, uh, one reason I wanted uh, to, to film and you to have you come in today was uh, that I know you have a new initiative at the McGraw Center, Principedia. Yes. Uh, so, can you tell us what that's all about and how it kind of uh, um, it, how it helps in your overall uh, goal of helping Princeton students here uh, adapt and develop their abilities to teach and learn. Yeah. Well, uh, so Principedia is based on an observation that Princeton students are good learners. Mm -hmm. They're excellent learners, often cases. And giving them general advice often isn't really the issue. Mm. So what we're trying to do is help them think about individual courses, the tasks that make up that course, and to reflect on that and actually develop a strategy and approach for each class. So one thing that's different in college and high schools, there's a lot of variety in the way that you're taught and a lot of complexity even within a class. You have a mm -hmm. lecture. You have precept, you have PSET, you have supplementary readings. Um, there's lots of channels of information and figuring out how to align one's learning to the instruction for one class, let alone different ones, is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. So our emphasis in McGraw, the kind of philosophy, is that it's context-specific kind of learning. And that actually reflects my graduate emphasis education. So uh, Principedia, what it's designed to do is collect the growing and developing insights of all students about how to learn at Princeton and how to learn in particular courses. So it's a crowdsourcing of the collective intelligence of Princeton students and other staff. So what we ask people to do is reflect uh, about how they're taught in a particular class, describe that, uh, identify challenges of, uh, of learning in those classes and then to describe strategies and methods, techniques, mental processes that they've adopted to achieve in those classes. Mm -hmm. Our thought is that that's an excellent thing for students to share. Uh, it's, it serves the interests of the faculty, serves the interests of the students. We all learn better when we talk about how are you learning. Mm -hmm. um, one way I like to capture that is we, a common phrase you'll hear from students is, how'd you do on a test, right? right. A project. And I would like them to say, how'd you do it? because then we opens up another kind of conversation, this methods processing, uh, processes of learning. So uh, 
you know, I'm going to be a freshman next year. I come into, you know, Princeton. I hear about this Principedia. I go in. What, what, what am I going to see? How am I yeah. going to navigate it? Great question. So, on the one Thank you. <laughs> we like good questions, so we think that right. the Prince Pete is all about asking slightly different questions. Um, well, what they're going to see, uh, we have a site right now, so it's, we're about to transform that. And so in the fall, it would look quite different. But so I just probably really by right now on the finished yeah. product that you'll see that we'll have the uh, current uh, version of Principedia up, but that will change and we'll hopefully um, edit the video to update like that. That would be update, fantastic. Update the video to show that. So what they're going to see is an interface that is gives them lots of ways to navigate to to different kinds of content. So some content is general. It's talking mm -hmm. about how to uh, adapt to Princeton learning, maybe large lecture classes, or what is a math class at Princeton expect of students, and how would you adjust? What is what do tests look like, and why? Uh, but we think that most unique content, hopefully the most powerfully uh, useful content, is descriptions of particular courses. So will be a, a way to navigate by department and students can go to those to a page that or click on a link to a department then within that department there'll be uh, ways to get to different classes so if they're signing up for eco 100 as a freshman and they want to know well how am i going to be taught in that class what are how might will we be able to be tested and what is a princeton student who's taken that class and thought about it a lot what advice can they share for me uh, about how to be successful there so There'll be these articles, they're wiki, so they can be added to uh, at all times. It's growing and developing. The key uh, way to navigate it, though, is that there are these, you can go through the department, you can go by the department. So mm -hmm. we think that students are thinking about learning in terms of their courses. So we want to deliver just in time advice in relation to a course. Now, how can I trust the information? Um, how is it curated and, and uh, to make sure that I go in and I can really, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I'm responsible for how I approach yeah. a class, but you know I, I need some help. How do I know this is going to steer me uh, to a better course? That's a very good. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, well, on the one I, hand, I, the, I think I'm batting a thousand right now with my yes. classes. Yes, yes, you are. Well, thank you. Um, the batting metaphor. I, I, that's right. I feel affirmed. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think one part of that is who we're soliciting content from. Mm -hmm. So tutors, peer advisors, learning consultants, uh, writing fellows—they spend a lot of time and acquire a lot of insight mm -hmm. by virtue of being a student, but then having these conversations. And so they're really deepening their knowledge. So they, they bring that not just to their tutoring in situ, uh, interactions, but to their own courses. And then we prompt them with a set of questions that we've uh, really crafted very mm -hmm. specifically. Okay. And so I think a lot of the quality control comes from the kinds of questions that we're asking them, and then the preparation and training that these students have gotten by virtue of their roles, and then that they're, you know, in many cases, they're advanced students in the classes. And, you know, they self-select. Princeton students want to give good advice. If they don't feel prepared to do it, they just don't choose to, right. to do so. Um, but then once it's up and available, we'll, we have some ways for people to add advice, um, to comment on other advice. Uh, yeah. And how, uh, we were talking about this before filming, um, you know, uh, eight years down the road, I look at uh, some class, I go on there, is it going to be just, you know, 10 pages long with all this information? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would be um, Might be disincentive dis to yeah. even uh, engage. Well, I think there's a challenge there, but one of the things we're doing is we have, we, we believe that the way each professor teaches the class and packages it is distinct and important to acknowledge and recognize. So we have articles for specific professors and mm -hmm. classes. And so I think that limits, it's not a long laundry list of every way that this class could be, Math 100 could be taught, mm -hmm. or that Anthro 345 is taught from year to year with different professors. Uh, that we really think it's important that you th uh, learn from the instruction that you receive from that instructor. And so that, that instructor, and so that, one of the consequences of that is that you're not going to get a long list of, in, of, of feedback. So compared to like course evaluations, if you look at course evaluations, sometimes that are online from Princeton, you know, there's some useful advice in there, but it's embedded with hundreds, sometimes with these big classes, mm -hmm. hundreds of other responses. It's not easy to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, there actually is good advice in there, uh, but it's hard to, to find. And I th we think this would be much more accessible. And how, uh, as of right now, how, how, uh, how much content is there? 
We've got about 45, 50 articles that we'll be developing, mm -hmm. and then there's a lot of content at, uh, at a more abstract level about how to learn in quantitative courses or in calculus generally, or what is calculus and how would you go about learning it. Uh, we, a lot of our content that, we, that exists on our website now will be folded in. Mm -hmm. So, and linked. So that's another thing that's a feature of the architecture is we'll have a lot more hyperlinks within our content. So when students are reading and thinking about a class, and they say, that's right, you know, uh, note taking in this class is really important according to this, but what are my methods? How, what's a good way to do that? Well, we have some content on our current site and so the linkages will be, be clearer. So in terms of the articles, there's about 40, but we have a lot of other content that will be included. Cool. So what question did I, did I not ask about Principedia? Where'd it come from? I, I don't know if I mentioned that. Where'd it come from? It was kind of a fun story. Uh, or I think it was. Uh, one day, because I think it, it points to the, really the knowledge and expertise of students. And that's really what, that's what Principedia is saying is students know a lot. Mm -hmm. They know more about learning in the class than the professor does who teaches it. And we want to recognize that and acknowledge that. And we want to help students have these conversations and exchange that knowledge and then organize it and circulate it. But one day I was in my office. This was actually at UC Berkeley. So I've been thinking about this idea for about six years or seven years now. And uh, the tutoring was happening right out of my office. That's just the nature of our arrangement. And I was listening to a, uh, I was working at my computer and I could hear this writing tutor that, that I knew because I did writing, I did training uh, of her cohort. And I was just listening and I was like, wow, she is really knowledgeable. She knows a lot about writing at Berkeley and it's very specific to the context. And I was just amazed at how much she knew. Then I, one thing I realized, I thought, you know what, a lot of that stuff she wasn't trained in either. We didn't teach her that as, mm -hmm. as the uh, sort of, uh, you know, administrators or program uh, developers. So then I realized, well, oh, and she's going to graduate. And I thought, oh, what a shame, mm -hmm. all that knowledge. <laughs> so I thought, I said, well, wait a second, that's kind of everybody. We all, we all recognize how much we learn in our four years of college or more years of college, and we carry it with us, but it's very siloed. We don't necessarily exchange, except sometimes in these trainings and things of tutors. How could we collect that? How could we organize that um, and then exchange that? And that was really the beginning of that. So I kind of had that question, uh, how would we collect the knowledge that all of us are developing, but we really don't have a forum to exchange it? So this is, uh, this is fairly unique then. I mean, it's not like a lot of colleges are It's doing first it. of its kind, wow. one and only at this point. Although Stanford is, I, th I talked with them, they like the idea, they've talked about Stanfordopedia. It doesn't quite roll it off. It doesn't roll off, yeah. It does yeah, not no. roll off the time. I appreciate their, uh, you know, getting on board, but uh, they, they might want to change the name. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I can't even think right now if anything how would you so no but uh, but you know the, i think that there is some kind of crowdsourcing and various other ways is happening from tutoring to mm -hmm. uh, but not not quite the same way we really hope that faculty get on board and administrators you have a lot of your preceptor you, you've seen lots and lots of students in mm -hmm. rca you've accumulated mm -hmm. a lot of knowledge and there's a place for your expertise as well in principia we just need to figure out how to tap that and then get it to students when they when they want it and need it right well, that's great, Nick. I, I just, uh, you know how much I appreciate your work uh, down at McGraw, and this is, I'm really excited about this. So thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for taking the initiative. I know it's a lot of work. Uh, but what's great is it really is a communal effort, and uh, I think it, it's just going to always be improving, which is really exciting. So, yeah, I think what students really like, just, I know that was, is they like the idea of leaving a legacy. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. No, I, and I see that all the time. I mean, like um, from Princeton Preview, where uh, just the freshmen here now want to give back yeah. uh, to the incoming uh, freshmen, or hopefully the incoming freshmen. And uh, the RCAs, they really do care about um, the, the students behind them, so to speak. Yeah, so if we can tap into that ethos, right. then uh, we can contribute to it and benefit from it. Well, great. Well, again, thank you for taking the initiative. Thank you for um, coming in today. And just, again, thank you for the great work at McGraw. Thank you, Matt. It was great. Awesome. Here.